Number 10, working in general. I know. World War I, 1914 to 1918. If you didn't guess already, this wasn't the age of women, or at least treating them right. It just wasn't. This, however, was the beginning of things changing. The war had a lot to do with that. When men went off to war, women had to fill their shoes in places of work. When in reality, a few years prior to that, a woman working was a ridiculous idea. But what's a gal gonna do when she's got no choice? Knuckle up, buckle down, and do it, do it, do it. It might seem silly today to even mention women going to work, but this is good history. In the beginning of women's suffrage, really the middle of it. Number nine, this one's really cool, I like this one, this one's crazy. The Radium Girls. Yes, the Radium Girls, this is just a crazy story. So, this material called radium was discovered and its glowing properties were quickly put to work for military application. You'll find a lot of times that military service often boosts technology development. Just how it goes. So when a factory that was producing glow-in-the-dark watches for the war effort needed workers, they looked to women to stand up to the challenge. Day in, day out, these women painted with radium paint. The women were advised to keep the brushes with a fine tip by placing it between their lips. Kind of just a little lick, a little, little kiss kind of, kind of cute. Some women even used it on their nails and others painted on each other. The novelty of glow-in-the-dark paint quickly wore off, however, when it proved to be very harmful to one's health, especially since the women had been ingesting the harmful paint. In the end, it was radiation sickness. One woman had it so bad her jaw simply fell off. That's not it. I saw the picture, bro. It's, it's, it's just gone. It's uh, uh. Number eight, the Canary Girls. A very similar story to the previous, but perhaps one you may be unfamiliar with. The Canary Girls sing a familiar tune to that of the Radium Girls, except it wasn't radioactive, but rather just TNT. How could TNT be harmful besides when it blows up, right? That's what I thought. The only trouble I've seen with TNT is when Wile E. Coyote accidentally blows himself up trying to get the Roadrunner. That's where I get all my scientific knowledge from. I'm a scientist, what can you say? Well, besides cartoon antics, TNT was quite harmful due to the chemicals that made it up. So harmful, it would make the women sick. It would turn their skin orange and hair yellow, like a big bird yellow. Yeah, that yellow. It even sadly affected children born whose mothers had been exposed to the chemicals. Canary babies, as they were so called. This is why we have work safety rules. And ladies, next time there's a global conflict, check what's in the factory first before they throw you in there. You don't want to catch any of that, that's bad for you. Number seven, ambulance driver. Chauffeurs and drivers were a man's job when cars began to take over the roads. You gotta imagine this is a time when cars are still really new. However, why use a man there when we could use him in the trenches? Many women were trained and drove ambulances from the battlefield staging area back to a safer, safer area where doctors and nurses await your arrival. The pay wasn't great, there was lots of screaming, and a slight chance of getting shelled by German artillery. There's a part of me that always gets nervous while watching footage of this time period. Like the cars just look kind of flimsy, right? And they look like they could fall apart at any minute. And driving through the mud and the blood, top speeds only are gonna be around 20 to 30 miles per hour tops. Cars get like 40 horsepower at most, which in case you didn't know is very slow. Usain Bolt on his best day runs twice that speed. I don't know if you, I, I hope you, you ever see that footage and the cars are so like, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't look they're gonna make it up the hill. It's weird. Number six, nurse. I know, I know. Yes, lots of ladies were, are, and going to be nurses. That's nothing new. And any nurse out there in the medical profession, Thank you for your service. Chetty thanks you. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in the medical profession how busy a hospital floor can be on a bad night. Nurses running around, paging doctors, phones ringing, papers flying, something about a code blue. Hectic, right? Well, imagine that, but less equipment. A hundred years less technology, and all whilst under the suppression and threat of bombardment. Great. Yeah, not so fun, right? Sure, any nurse has comfy sketchers to take her to the graveyard ship, but no nurse has blast-proof equipment to treat people in a graveyard, as this is a field hospital and this is the best they can do for the time being. Yeah, see, that's not fun. That's kind of unusual. Is, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Number five, ladies of the trench. This makes sense. A lot of sense, really. And as weird and crazy as it might sound, it might have made the men feel a little bit better. Trench life was awful. Refer to my World War I videos here. They're pretty good, I promise. Mud, blood, rats, disease, sickness, machine guns, barbed wire, no man's land, chemical warfare, and sadly, when all that was done and gone, brutal, borderline, medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. That just must be terrible. I played Battlefield 1, that's fun, but in real life, that's just not fun. So when soldiers were taken out of rotation for a little R&R, &R, they might be pleased to see a brothel on wheels. 
Eagles. That's right. Or when visiting certain northern towns in France, a very legal brothel uh, houses, if you will. When Americans joined the fight, of 1,000 men being treated in hospital, 190 were being treated for a brothel related sickness. Go get them, boys. Some men would even ask for ladies who were known to possess such qualities because they knew if they caught it, it meant 30 days in a bed and not in a trench. That's honestly such a big brain play, I can't even. Number four, widow. Might not be an official occupation, but it is an official title, and officially, it sucks. Imagine a world where it's difficult to get by, a world where a woman is a second class citizen. So when her husband, her brother, her father, and maybe even her son get drafted to fight Germany and don't make it back, well, it's, it's not fun. Some struggled to find work, others remarried, and some had no choice but to practice the time old tradition of the world's oldest profession, if you know what I mean. Tough times, man. Especially for the ladies, not cool. Number three, farmers. Gotta tend to those fields, partner. This is also a time where there is farm equipment, yes, but not as common as today. It would have been expensive and nowhere near the state of the art farm equipment that we have today. Milking machines, combines, tractors, you name it. In 1914, it's offspring. That's your farm equipment. That's how it works. Ever notice how farmhouses got lots of bedrooms? Well, if you can't afford to hire farmhands, then you make some. Except, however, the key issue with the last point as well as here is the men in your family getting sent to war. Not coming back for four years is a problem. Or in a worst case scenario, not coming back at all. I mean, I'm sure some came back, they just came back in boxes. Which means wives, women, sisters, and daughters had to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And I don't have to tell any farmer watching this how important their job is, or how difficult it can be. You gotta feed the folks after all. Gotta do what's right by me, Dutch. <laughs> I don't know why farming's western, but all right. Number two, dancer. Little bit of a stretch here, but hear me out. World War I ended in 1918. By 1920, the Allies' economies had picked up, but especially in America. This was a time of great success, as a wise man once said. The Roaring Twenties, while the war was over, many folks were still feeling the effects, especially in Europe. Germany wasn't doing too hot, and they're gonna come back for a sequel. It's not gonna be good. As the sale of alcohol was banned, underground clubs began to open. Speakeasies, you may have heard them from my 20s videos. Men, soldiers returning home, women, and minorities of all backgrounds were hanging out in these places, which was very progressive and cool for the time. The ladies were becoming flappers, which were dancers, out of the factories and enjoying the luxuries of a healthy economy. And I'm sure some of it had to start in 1918 at least because they knew the end was coming. It had to. It just had to. Trust me, it makes sense. Number one, politicians. For the first time in a long time, women were becoming politicians. Not presidents or governors, but their voices were being heard in the political space regardless, which is huge. A one Miss Rankin was voted into the US House of Representatives in 1916. A woman's right advocate, all brought to you by women's suffrage. I don't have to tell you how unusual that really is for the time. Especially for the time. Unfortunately for these ladies, while there would be some great step forwards like earning the right to vote and social progress in the 1920s, things would go back a few steps during the 40s and the 50s and wouldn't see massive resurgence until the late 60s and 70s. You gotta remember the good stuff though, even if it's baby steps. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming fran time, whatever you wanna call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. 
Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma, and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of yieldy times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it. Seriously. Although, I'd certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserve, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him, he's a chef, he said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly, becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. 
Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land, sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. Number 10, soldier. Yes, that's right. There were female soldiers during the war. Not as many as Call of Duty Vanguard would like you to believe there was, but there was. There was. This was the 1940s. Women were still fighting for equality, in particular the resistance groups of Europe that were fighting the oppression of German occupation, most famously being the French resistance during the German occupation of France. Women like Nicole Manet were active ground soldiers, just not in a professional army, usually operating in the shadows and with sabotage. However, every once in a while head-on-head -head combat was engaged. It's not a professional army, but they're, they're soldiers. It counts. I checked. I called the chief. He said it counts. Number nine, spy. The name's Bond. James Bond. Except, no, it's, it's not, because we're talking about lady spies. That's right. If you asked your grandmother what she did during World War II, she might say, I worked in a factory. I was a baker, a farmer, and a nurse. Somebody worked in a military office or something like that. What you might be surprised to hear, however, is that grandma was a spy. Yes, that's right. Espionage. I think a lot of people think about the CIA, MI6, or KGB when they think about spies, and you'd be right, as that was the golden age of spy versus spy. However, everything has its start, and it all started in World War II. The OSS, for example, is stated to have over 13,000 members. One of every nine was a woman. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. You never know who to trust really. Could be a dude, could be a woman, could be mom, could be dad. You just don't know. It could be grandma. You never know. Number eight, pilot. This is partly to do with the logistics issue of war, but again, without women in the fight, it would not have gone so smoothly. Basically, the idea boils down to we need every available man in the war effort. Soldiers, pilots, technicians, sailors, officers, engineers, drivers. Just about anyone who was able to, and even some of those who weren't, were thrown into the mix. That's what it's like for men. That means we got some uh, that means we have to get some iron-willed ladies who aren't afraid to roll up their sleeves, and that means a lot of women because women are not afraid to roll up their sleeves. That's how that's how it goes. To get the job done. This included female pilots. Not in combat, but arguably just as important. Actually, no, not arguable. It is just as important. Delivery, hear me out. The US and Britain were pumping out war machines the same way I pumped Doritos into my boiler on a Saturday night. However, if you walked into a warehouse full of complete airplanes after coming off the factory, how do you get them to the desired area? Right, the answer is getting brave women to make countless flights in order to get the planes where they needed to be. I think a lot of people just don't think about that stuff. When you make the stuff, you gotta get it from point A to point B. 
And we have a lot of women to thank for that. Number seven, Rivet Rosie. I did mention this in my World War One video, but this is where the magic really happened. Rivet Rosie, editor, put a picture up. Of Rivet Rosie, right back there or something. Put a picture, or maybe in front of me, I don't know. Rivet Rosie. Some theory holds water here. We needed the ladies to roll up their sleeves and start welding, stamping, and producing war materials for the war effort. World War II was the most destructive war in human history, but something that I think just doesn't get talked about enough is the massive logistics issue that went on. Millions of resources being manufactured and shipped all over the world from the US just to put a stop to the mustache man and his two henchmen. Not one tank, gun, bullet, or bootstrap would be possible without the efforts of women in factories. And that's just the truth. Number six, mother. Hey, listen, being a mom is tough. It's a process, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. But sadly, a lot of moms got knocks on the doors in the 1940s when they didn't want to. Got a folded American flag and condolences from Uncle Sam. Given the number of men that lost their lives during the conflict, it's a knock on the door that happened all too often. However, on the other side of the pond, it was a similar story, except in places like Berlin, there was no door, or maybe even a house, because it was bombed to smithereens. Imagine trying to raise a kid in a place like that. When your town looks like something from Fallout. Yeah, it's not easy. So shout out to all the moms out there that lived through it one day at a time and made it through. Number five, Sniper. Lyudmila Pavelchenko was a Russian sharpshooter during World War II. This is a woman who was in active combat and is credited with over 300 KIAs. That's a lot of dudes. See, this is a lady we need a movie or a game about Hollywood. While in quality of the 1940s was very much existent in the Soviet Union during World War II, her, her bravery and service is to be commemorated. But if you know history, and you know how well the Russian invasion went for Germany, and especially in the first few months, the Soviet Union applied a strategy I like to call anything goes. Meaning, until they received supplies and aid from their newly found allies to the east, Russia, being Russia, was going to throw anything at the Germans to stop them. That included female soldiers on the ground. She was one of a few Russian sharpshooters that proved to be very effective in combat and as a tool of propaganda for the state. It just makes sense. Number four, Nagasaki. This one is a broad stroke, but basically anyone who was in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, finger quote, working on those special days, that counts as an unusual job. Maybe you've worked construction, or you worked some really hot sunny days. It's rough, maybe you worked in an office where the gears of bureaucracy and red tape hold you back from doing your best. Headache maker, am I right? Imagine you're working your job and literally 10 seconds later, you hear the largest bomb ever to fall on a city all of a sudden. And it's gone, like the city's just gone. It was there a second ago, but now it's gone. I don't wanna get into too much horrific detail in case the YouTube gods are listening and they might smite me, but Google Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You'll see what I mean. Number three, pinup girl. Models, actresses, and anyone who had hips that don't lie had their images printed, painted, and posted everywhere for informal display. That's right, informal. Intentions on this one are completely dishonorable. But at the same time, might have helped, I don't know. Where would we be if Betty Grable wasn't showing some ankle on every B-52 bomber that was Berlin bound? See, exactly, I know. Ask grandpa, he'll tell you. While these glamorous ladies may not have been directly involved in the war effort, it was their job to remind those boys just what they were fighting for. I salute you, sailors. Number two, code breakers. This was a time before computers and the internet. So if a German code came across your desk, you couldn't just ask Google, what in the heck does that mean? We owe a lot to the code breakers. Shout out to Alan Turing. Cause he's pretty smart. But it's the women in all the military offices everywhere in every allied nation working every day to make the enemy's information get revealed. It's actually very important that happens, trust me. Which in the long run saved lives. A lot of lives. I'll be honest too. Some of the stuff they had to help decipher wasn't easy. I struggle enough with Call of Duty zombie Easter eggs. Yeah, don't don't call me for that. I, I'll, t I'll carry you to high rounds, but I can't get you. I can't solve the Easter egg, man. I'll carry it, but it's not gonna happen. Number one, everyone else. This one goes out to every woman who, in some way or another, participated in the world's worst conflict. Mothers, nurses, doctors, code breakers, everyone. I'm putting a blanket over everyone here because there's just there's too many not to mention. But the point I'm getting across is that we could not have done it without the help of girl power. And here at Bumblebee, we remember that. And me, Chetty, your local Chris Farley or John Candy or something in between, whatever I am. Remember, I salute you ladies. Thank you for your service. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. 
Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other, all because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face 
because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this, how many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. 
You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, Crimes of the Heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands' or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part 2, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife, how horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out of wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. 
a little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you in turn have to, you can't move. Just what you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, Ah, oh, man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport. Know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess. Gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up. I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision. You know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Theodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, 
also real name. Her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then they were flammable as is but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic's not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're going to go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later. But later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo bet, and then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum either in assets or money to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. On number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back 
then people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama, discovered after marriage vows were exchanged, caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the speak now or forever hold your peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny foo foo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened, you had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. 
Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package, well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paper work side of things, but once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me, but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least, and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Right. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place. Like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's right was something even more horrific. The droit de seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now, just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late middle age and renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first knight or a hefty fee. So either you pay for it, or I do it. The Dois de Signor was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. 10. It's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era. And who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. 
Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling? Yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend. Oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh... Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial unaliver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. 
There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old Blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that one next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. 